Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Um, today, we are right here. So we are going to be talking about Monte Carlo methods for reinforcement learning. Uh, not only that, but at the end of the PowerPoint slides, and I'll try to have a timestamp down in the YouTube video, um, I'm going over the final project specification for the uh, 6980, which is the grad version of this course. So stick around for that because I'll, I'll be explaining this entire document and my recommendations to you uh, at the end of this class. Uh, but first, let's dive right in to Monte Carlo methods. Alrighty. So lecture number 16, we're still talking about reinforcement learning. And uh, today is all about Monte Carlo methods. And if you want more in-depth uh, explanation of this, this is uh, chapter five in the reinforcement learning textbook is, um, is Monte Carlo method. So uh, screen capture right now if you want to type out that URL or it's in the slides if you're in the course. So what are Monte Carlo methods? Uh, they're methods for estimating value functions and discovering optimal policies, okay? So it's a method that can help you um, solve problems within the reinforcement learning framework. But unlike dynamic programming, we do not assume complete knowledge of the environment or a model of the environment. So MC methods require only experience, okay? So we're gonna be interacting with the environment somehow, and we're going to get a sequence of states, actions, and rewards from either an actual environment, like a robot in the real world, or a simulated environment like a video game, for example. So whereas dynamic programming, which we talked about last time, requires a complete model of the environment, so you need basically the source code of whatever it is you're working on, or all the state transition functions, etc. Monte Carlo methods do not need that, okay? So this is where the power of reinforcement learning starts to become unlocked, is with Monte Carlo methods. So let's talk about actual versus simulated experience. So when I talk about something like actual experience, I'm talking about something like me in the real world or a physical robot that actually walks around, right? Learning from actual experience does not require a model of the environment. So for example, um, humans don't need to know the source code to the universe in order to learn things, right? So. Um, if we look back at heuristic search, heuristic search needed a model of the environment in order to do things like um, look ahead search, right? So we needed a model there. Um, with whether that was A star or alpha beta, we needed a model of the environment. With dynamic programming, we needed a model of the environment. But for Monte Carlo methods, we do not need to know a model of the environment. And I'm repeating this because it's very, very important and it's a good exam question. So the agent will take an action, it will carry it out, and it will get a reward from the environment. And that's all it needs. It doesn't need to necessarily know how the environment works. It just needs to know, I did this thing when I saw this thing, and I got this reward. That, that's all it needs to know. So simulated experience then is like a video game or a computer simulation. Learning from a simulated experience is also powerful because we, we don't need to know how the model works. We only need to know like the state transition function, right? So if we are actually carrying out a simulation, we need to know what the simulation is, right? We don't necessarily need to know like the source code. We just need access to the simulation in order to perform our experiments. So Monte Carlo doesn't need to know all of the action or state probability distributions whereas DP does. So that's, that's why we would use something like Monte Carlo over something like dynamic programming. But first, let's talk about Monte Carlo a bit more. Monte Carlo methods use something called sampling, okay? So um, sampling is just when you take a sample from some environment and then you take many, many, many samples and from those samples, you can do some sort of statistical analysis from them and figure out some sort of thing from that analysis, okay? So for example, over here on the left, there's a screenshot of a Monte Carlo method for approximating pi. Now you might ask how that works. Well, let's actually open up down here. I've got a URL. Um, I'm gonna open up that and uh, let me do that right now. 
So I've got this open right here on my main monitor and let me paste this link in the chat for people who want to follow along. So let me just read uh, what this is doing. So we've got a square and inside the square, we've got a circle, okay? And let's just read the text on this website because there's not much to it. So one method to estimate the value of pi, 3.14159, whatever, is by using the Monte Carlo method or a Monte Carlo method. In the demo above, we have a circle of radius 0.5 enclosed by a one by one square. So that means this circle here is enclosed in a square that has side length one. That means the radius is 0.5, okay? Um, the area of the circle is pi r squared, which is equal to pi over four when the radius is 0.5. The area of the square is one, right? So if we divide the area of the circle by the area of the square, we get pi over four. We then generate a, <clears throat> excuse me, a large number of uniformly distributed random points and plot them on the graph. These points can be in any position within the square. So for example, they could be up here, they could be down here, they could be inside the circle, outside the circle, doesn't matter. We're just generating random points within the square. If they fall within the circle, they're colored red, otherwise they're colored blue. We keep track of the total number of points and the number of points that are inside the circle. If we divide the number of points within the circle, n inner, so that's the number of points inner inside the circle, by the total number of points, n total, we should get an a value that's an approximation of the ratio of the areas that we calculated above. So in other words, pi over four is approximately equal to the ratio. So pi over four is the area of this circle. One is the area of the square, right? So pi over four should be approximately equal to the ratio between the number of random points that fall within the circle to the number of total random points, because that's the area of the circle to the, the ratio between the area of the circle to the total area of the square. And so pi then would be approximately equal to four times the number of points that are generated inside the circle divided the number of points outside the circle. When we only have a small number of points, the estimate is not very accurate, but when we have hundreds of thousands of points, we get much closer to the actual value. You can add points one at a time or click the animate checkbox to add as many points as you want to the graph very quickly. So let's just look at this. So we're gonna click animate and animate is going to start adding points, random points, right? If they're inside the circle, they're colored red. If they're outside the circle, they're colored blue. And pi is equal to four times the ratio between them. So we have, we're counting the total number of points that are inserted, the total number of points within the circle. And we can see here that we have our pi estimate, which is currently equal to 3.13. But if we speed that up, to add a bunch more points, then eventually as we add tens and tens of thousands of points, our approximation of pi gets closer and closer to the actual value, okay? So this is called a Monte Carlo method because it's taking random samples and it's doing some statistics. So right here, the statistics are is the ratio between the area of the circle to the area of the square. And based on that, we're finding out some sort of, we're solving some problem that we want to solve. And in this case, it's an approximation of the value of pi, okay? And you see very quickly within just a few seconds, we've gotten to 3.138, which is within a few decimal places of pi, okay? So this is a Monte Carlo method in action here. Now let's go back to slides. Similarly, we could think of a Monte Carlo method to do something like estimate um, the area under a graph. Okay, so in this, I don't have an animation of this one, but we could figure out an integral of a function by taking some area within a graph, right? So we chop the X values at some minimum and some maximum. Then we're gonna generate uh, a bunch of points, uh, a bunch of X points. We'll run it through the function. We'll see whether or not the point was above the line or below the line by just evaluating the function. And then we sum up the ratio between them and divide it by the total area and we can approximate the area under a graph or in the integral of that 
via Monte Carlo sampling method. So I know I've only showed two, uh, two different methods here and they're both kind of area ratio calculations. That's definitely not the only use for uh, Monte Carlo methods, but it's just one of the more visual ones. So I wanted to show you how they're used. So Monte Carlo methods are able to solve reinforcement learning problems using samples. And it learns based on averaging the returns from those samples. And so we're going to discuss Monte Carlo methods for episodic tasks. Remember we talked about episodic and continuing tasks. This lecture, we're talking about episodic tasks. So all of our experiences are going to be divided, divided into finite episodes and all episodes are going to be guaranteed to eventually terminate. Okay. So value estimate and policy updates are performed only at the end of an episode. And I'll have a bunch of examples of this throughout the slide. So don't worry if you don't understand just yet. So Monte Carlo method sample and average returns for each state action pair, just like bandit methods do. So we talked about that bandit method. Remember when we were pulling the slot machines, you can think of that as a Monte Carlo method. Okay. Because we're just pulling slot machines, right? We're taking samples and we're updating it. They compute average rewards for each action. We're going to treat each state essentially as a bandit problem. And each of these bandit problems are related because the return after actions depends on the future actions. Like what I do right now at this state, is going to affect what happens at another state, possibly. So because all action selections are learning, the problem is non-stationary to previous states, okay? So our action returns could, or our action rewards could change as we go based on the updating of values at other states. So Monte Carlo methods can even solve non-stationary problems depending on how we, we perform our updates. Okay, so Monte Carlo prediction. And again, prediction is the part of the reinforcement learning problem where we try and predict or estimate the value functions. So to begin, we want to learn the state values or the action values for a given policy. So we're given some policy pi and we want to learn. So the value of the state, if we want to recall this from last lecture, is the expected return or the sum of discounted rewards starting from the current state. So one intuitive way that we could obtain the state value is the following sort of procedure. So carry out an episode using a given policy, record all of the states that we visited in the episode, average the return after visiting a state, and then update the value estimate of the state with the average of those returns. Okay. And eventually, if we take enough samples over time, this is going to converge to the expected value, right? So this is es essentially the same thing as pulling those slot machines back in the bandit um, lecture. However, now we're pulling slot machines at each state and not just one set of slot machines. Okay. And down here, this is just sort of the, the lar law of large numbers where if we take enough samples, eventually this converges to the average, the true average or the true expected value, which will give us eventually the optimal policy. So just quick, a quick note to bring us up to speed from previous lecture, what is a value? It's the expected return from a specific state or a specific situation. So V pi of S. That's the expector expected future return when starting in state S and following a policy and Q pi. So V is the value of a state and Q is the value of an action at a state. So that's the expected future return. When we start in S take an action and then follow the policy. Okay. So let's do an example. We'll do a full example from blackjack. Okay. So if you're not familiar with the rules of blackjack, I'll, I'll demonstrate an example here. So blackjack is played in hands or episode. Um, it's going to give us a reward of zero at every state except the terminal state. Okay. That means as I take actions in blackjack, as I choose hit or stand or whatever, I'm not getting any return immediately until the end of the episode. Okay. At the end of the episode, when I get, uh, if I win, I get a plus one reward. If I lose, I get a minus one reward. And if I 
got lucky and got a blackjack. Well, blackjacks typically pay out 1.5, and so that would be a 1.5 reward, okay? So let's go through an example now. So at the beginning of a hand of blackjack, so for, for people who aren't familiar with blackjack, blackjack is a card game played between a player and a dealer, okay? Um, you're going to shuffle and deal some cards, and the object of the game is to get as close to 21 as possible, so the sum of the values of your cards, without going over 21. If you go over 21, you just lose, okay? So you want to get as close as possible to 21. The dealer in blackjack has a fixed policy, meaning that the dealer will always hit, meaning it wants new cards, until it gets to 17 or higher, and then, then it will stand. Okay, so your object is to beat the dealer. So at the beginning of a hand of blackjack, and, and each hand is independent, okay? So at the beginning of a hand of blackjack, you shuffle up the cards, and you deal them to the dealer, and you deal them to the player. So first, you deal the cards to the dealer. So the dealer is going to get one card face down, and one card face up. And this is part of, I guess, the skill of blackjack, is knowing that, okay, while the dealer has a four, this could be any card. So this could be a two, they could have a total of six, it could be a 10, they could have a four, total of 14, for example. So one dealer card is hidden from the player, and then the player cards are dealt to each player. We're only dealing with the case of one player right now, but essentially a multiplayer game of blackjack, all the players are competing against the same dealer. So you can think of um, a multiplayer game of blackjack as a bunch of single player games of blackjack for all intents and purposes, okay? So, we've been dealt a 3 and a 4, and the dealer's been dealt a 4, okay? All of these cards are going to be diamonds, but they are dealt from a full deck. I was just too lazy to go. I was copying and pasting this from, like, a sheet of diamond cards, so I didn't want to, you know, go to multiple sheets just to get some clubs and spades. But they are dealt from an entire deck. Actually, sometimes they are dealt from multiple decks, okay? So you can consider the deck that the cards are being dealt from as infinitely large, Okay, so we're not able to really glean anything from the statistics of like the cards that might be remaining in the deck. That's called card counting. It's not allowed in casinos. And um, for for this purpose of Monte Carlo, um, of, of showing a Monte Carlo explanation, we're just assuming that the deck is infinitely big. So we don't need to worry about that. So after the dealing of the cards, we get the starting state of our episode. Okay, so the episode starts once the cards have been dealt. And that's because the dealing of the cards is not an action, right? The dealing of the cards is like the setting up of the pieces on a chessboard. That's, that's where, like, the, the episode starts now, okay? So, we've got a 3 and a 4. That totals up to 7. And the dealer is showing a 4. So what we're going to do in order to encode this state is we're going to say the starting state is where the player has 7 and the dealer has a 4. So we're just calling that state 7-4, okay? So I have 7, dealer has 4. Now, there are more complex situations that you can get into blackjack where you have an ace that could be worth a 1 or a 10. It's called like a soft 14 or a soft 15, whatever your sum is. We're not dealing with that right now for the purposes of explanation. Just realize that that could happen. So here we're just going to be dealing with uh, an easy example where that doesn't happen. Now... The actions that I can take, so the player takes all of their actions first in blackjack, okay? Then the dealer just goes through its policy. So the players that, the actions that the player can take are to hit, meaning I'm going to take another card, so the, another random card will be dealt and added to your sum, or you can stand or stick or stay, um, surprising how many ST words mean no more cards, please, but it's either hit or stand, okay? Now, in an actual game of blackjack, you can have doubling down and you can have splitting, but we're just, we're ignoring those for now to make this as, as simple as possible and so I can fit it on the slides, all right? So, the player is going to take an action, and let's say the player is reasonable, and with seven, they're going to choose to hit, okay? So, they chose to hit, and that's from some policy pi that we have out there in the ether, okay? So, we've started with some policy. Maybe that policy is like, my brain and how much I know about blackjack. 
Maybe that policy is written down for me, so I've carried in a little cheat sheet of blackjack what I should do at a certain state. Or maybe I'm just rolling a dice and I'm taking random actions, okay? It's just, we take some action from some policy. We're not concerned with what that policy is right now, but just understand that there is a policy somewhere that's guiding our actions. And it said, when I have seven and the dealer has four, I'm going to hit, okay? So I choose hit and the state has now been updated, okay? So the state has been updated. I've gotten a two. And so now my sum is three plus four plus two, which is nine. So now we're at state nine, four. Also, when I chose to hit, at state 7-4, I got a reward from the environment. However, because of the rules of blackjack, I'm not going to get paid or lose my money until the very end of the episode. So my reward from choosing hit, if I haven't immediately won or lost, is going to be zero. So I've gotten a new card, nothing has happened yet, my reward is zero. So you can see here that I've gotten... Um, so I started out and I was at state zero. Okay, so state zero is the initial state, seven, four. I took action zero at state zero, which was to hit. After taking action zero at state zero, I'm now at state one and I've gotten reward one. Okay, so remember when we talked about reinforcement learning, we got state, action, reward, state, action, reward. So we start out in state zero, we take action zero, we get reward one, and then we're at state one and we take action one, okay? So here now, here is our state one after taking one action. Now, I could have gotten any card here, right? This could have been a king, it could have been a jack, it could have been a nine, it could have been a six. It just so happens that this time in this episode, it was a two, right? So this is an example of an, of a, an environment that's stochastic, right? Because I was at this state, seven, four, I chose an action and the state that I end up in is pretty much random, right? The, the dealer card is still going to be a four, but this could have been anywhere from a seven to a 17, right? Depending on the card that I got. So this is just an example of one episode or one outcome from taking the action hit at the state seven, four. All right. But that's the one I chose for this example. Okay. So now um, I got my reward. It's time to take a new action. So let's say that my policy says that I should hit again. So action one is hit. So I'm going to get another card. So here I get another card. It happens to be a five. So now, um, I'm at state two from state one and state two is I have 14. The dealer still has four and my reward from taking the action hit. Well, I haven't busted yet. So my reward is still zero, okay? So I got a reward after the first action. I got a reward after the second action. They were both zero. Now, I'm gonna choose to hit again. Whether or not that's the correct thing to do, we're not, you know, we're not talking optimal blackjack strategy here. I'm just doing this as an example. So we're gonna choose hit again. So action two, which is the action I took at state two, is going to be hit. And what's gonna happen? Whew, I got lucky. Okay, I got a six. So I have 20 now. So typically when you're at 20, you want to stand, right? Because if you go over 21, you just bust and you lose immediately. So my reward from taking action three, which was the stick or sorry, which was the hit was a zero, right? Because I haven't won or lost the game yet. So now I'm at state three. I have 20. The dealer is showing a four. Okay, let's choose to stand. All right, we'll choose to stand now because that's, like a decent thing to do. My policy isn't, isn't completely dumb. It's telling me when I have 20, maybe I should stand. Okay. So now what happens in blackjack, it's very interesting because you may think that now I have to go into the actions of the dealer. Okay. This is a very important lesson and blackjack is a very good example of this. In for Monte Carlo methods for reinforcement learning, the dealer is just part of the environment. Okay. If you think about it, the dealer actually does not have any decisions to make because the policy is given to the dealer by the casino. They have to hit until they get 17 or more. They have no decisions. 
So when I choose stand, there is no more series of states as the dealer gets their cards. This just essentially for the purposes of reinforcement learning or our simulation, it instantly transitions into the outcome of what would happen if the dealer implements this policy. So bam, the dealer implements their policy and I instantly transition into another state. Okay. So what happened? Well, the dealer ended up having a five as their whole card, which added to four, that was 12, or uh, sorry, nine, I'm getting ahead of myself. They chose to hit because nine is less than 17. They got a three, now they're at 12. 12 is still less than 17, so they chose to hit and they got a king, so the dealer got 22. 22 is more than 21, and so that's a bust state for the dealer. The dealer busted, meaning they're over 21, which is I win. Okay, so the terminal states in blackjack are essentially win, lose, or draw, right? So in this case, state four is win. And my reward from taking the action stand at A3, at, so I took action stand as A3 at state three. My reward of taking that action is one because I won the game, okay? So that's, that's a little confusing there at the end, is that the dealer is not doing any of this reinforcement learning action selection. Just think of the dealer as part of the environment, and when you click stand, right, you just instantly transition into a winning state in this episode. It might be a losing state. For example, maybe the dealer chose to hit, got 12, and then chose a nine and got 21, as they always do, right? Dealer always gets 21. So this is now a losing state. And my reward from doing action stand at state three would now be a negative one, okay? So let's just go back and make sure we're understanding this. When I'm at state three, which is this state right here, if I choose stand, sometimes I might win and get a reward of one, sometimes I might lose and get a reward of negative one, okay? That's the random nature of blackjack, right? Or maybe the dealer actually gets 20 and that's a push or a tie. And so this is like a draw state, right? We have a tie. So the reward from that episode would be zero. So the reward in blackjack is zero up until the very end. In other games, you might be winning or losing a little bit of money along the way, okay? But in Blackjack, you don't get the reward until the very end. So that is one episode of Blackjack. And then the cards would be shuffled and you'd deal a new episode and you'd take those actions. So let's summarize this all on one screen now so we can start to do some reinforcement learning with that. So the player got dealt a four and a three and the dealer got, sh got dealt a four, okay? so. State zero was seven, four. I have a seven, they have a four. Action zero was hit. I got a two, right? So the two just showed up to add to my sum. The reward, my first reward was zero because the game's not over yet. The episode isn't over. State one, well, I add the two to the seven. Now we're at state nine, four, okay? My action here was also hit and I got a five. My reward was zero. I add the five, so now I'm at state 14, four. Action two was hit again. I got a six, my reward is still zero. Action, uh, state three, well, I add six to 14, I get to state 24. Action three was now stand, and that, as soon as I stand, the dealer implemented its policy, and that led to the dealer busting, okay? And the busting meant that I won, and so my reward for taking that action is four, okay? Or sorry, <laughs> my reward was one, apologies. So, and then if, if necessary, the terminal state that I ended up with was a win state, which is, which is me getting one from that, okay? So the state sequence that we went through was as follows, seven, four, nine, four, 14, four, 24, and then if necessary, the win state, okay? The action sequence that we went through was hit, 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 stand. 
Or if we want to assign like integer values to those, maybe hitting is one and sticking is zero, okay? Or standing is zero. So our actions were one, 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 zero. The reward sequence that we went through was zero, 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 one, right? And the future return sum for each one, okay, was one, 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 one. Now, what in the hell does that mean? It means that from any given state in this episode, if I sum all the rewards up until the end of the episode and mark that value down, then that is the eventual return from that state. And remember, it's the return that we want to average. Okay. So if we then want to take these values and actually update our belief of the values or our estimation of values, let's say we're doing the action value estimate. Okay. So our Q pi of S a for each of these state action pairs, well, the first state action. So the first state was seven, four, and my first action was one. Now, the reward that I get from the end of the episode is my new target to update my belief at this state. So remember before we had a bunch of different methods for updating our estimate at a given state. Some of them for one of them was like the average, right? So we're going to keep all of our returns and average them. Um, another one was uh, the sample, the incremental update method. Right? So whatever that method is, that's what this update call is. So we're going to update our belief of how good this state action pair is by feeding in the reward of one or the return of one. Right? So I have my Q array somewhere. We went over this last time, my state seven, four, however I encoded this right now, just, just recall that this is not like valid JavaScript or anything like that. I'm at state seven, four, however, I've chosen to encode that I've taken action one. I get some return. And so now I'm going to update my belief. So whatever this value was before, if it was zero and now it's one, then maybe I take the average and maybe it's 0.5 now, right? Similarly for each state in this state sequence, for each state action pair in the state sequence, I'm updating those Q values. Similarly, I could update the state values. Okay. So the state value estimates, I could just say, well, my state value V, well, I'm going to call the update function with a return of one on those. All right. So that's, that's how we could do it. And this ends up being our, our first Monte Carlo prediction algorithm called every visit Monte Carlo prediction. And I'll talk about what every visit means in a second. So here's what we do for Monte Carlo for every visit MC. We're going to start off with some initial values for each state action pair. Remember last time when we had the bandits, we had to choose an initial value for those. Maybe they're zero. Maybe there's something else. Maybe they're random. Let's just say they're zero, for example. So we're going to start out with some initial values for each of our state action pairs. We're going to have returns for our state action pairs. Okay. This is an empty list for each state that we're going to be essentially keeping track of over time. So whatever returns we got at each state and each action so that we can keep a running average over time. Then while true, so in an infinite loop, essentially, now this is not really infinite. We're going to just go for some amount of episodes. So this should maybe should be while we want to do more episodes, we're going to generate an episode with my policy pi. Remember? So I just did that, that example for blackjack. So I took my policy and I generated an episode of blackjack and that ended up in state zero, action zero, reward one, state one, action one, right? So we produce this and here's the algorithm just for time step zero to T. So we're going to go through each time step in the episode. What we do is we calculate our return G, which is the sum. Oops, there's a typo here. Let me fix that. So here it is. Um, G is the sum of the rewards from the current state up to the terminal state, right? So from this state, we sum all of the rewards from here on, and we keep track of that. Then we're going to append G 
to the returns of STAT. So that's just some collection that says, well, whenever I took this action at this state, I eventually got a return of this. And then we update our Q value at state T action T to be the average of those returns. Okay, so all we do is we keep a running average of the returns following every state that we visited in each episode. And this really makes sense, right? We try something out, we keep track of how well we did, and then at the end of the episode, we go back to each state that we visited, and for each action that we took, we update our values to reflect what we actually achieved in that episode. So if we got a good result from this episode, then our beliefs after we do the update are gonna be a little bit better. If we got uh, a poor result from this episode, um, our beliefs are gonna be a little bit worse. So let me just go back real quick um, to this state right here, okay? So let's say we are at this state where we have 20, right? And the dealer has four. Over many, many episodes, if we hit here a bunch of times, we're gonna find that we bust a lot and so we get a bunch of negative rewards, right? If we choose stand here, we're going to find that we win a lot and we get a bunch of positive rewards. So if we choose hit here, we're going to update our um, belief of how good this state is and taking that action at that state with the new better value. Or if we're hitting, we're probably gonna get negative values. If we're standing, we're gonna get positive values, okay? So the value of that state is going to end up being very positive because the standing value of that state is very good. So as we play millions of hands of blackjack and we encounter this state over and over and over again, we will learn that the value of choosing stand is higher than the value of choosing hit. So when we then eventually go to update our policy, we will want to choose to stand at that state. And this is the very simple algorithm that does that. You probably could have come up with that algorithm. Now, I've got a couple of blank lines here, and I'll show you what that is in a second. So Monte Carlo prediction, we want to estimate V pi of S or Q pi of S A given a set of episode, episodes that were obtained by following the policy pi, right? Each occurrence of a state S in an episode is called a visit to S and each state may be visited multiple times in an episode. Now, in blackjack, because the sum keeps going up, essentially, we can never visit the same state of blackjack twice in one hand. That's just a property of blackjack. But if we think about a pathfinding example, maybe our initial policy tells us to go in a circle and we could visit the same state multiple times, okay? So what we just showed was every visit MC. But so, so first visit Monte Carlo methods, estimate V as the average of returns following the first visit only. Every visit MC have different theoretical properties and, and it's used for things like function approximation. So, so the real difference between every visit MC and first visit MC is that every visit MC may update the state's value or a state action pair value for a single state multiple times if it is visited more than once during an episode, okay? However, that's not always desired since the first visit will contain a deeper calculation than on subsequent visits. And what that means is like, picture you're driving to work and you're trying to estimate the amount of time it will take to get to work, right? Using a Monte Carlo method. Let's say that something really weird happens and you end up driving like in a loop somewhere and going back to a state that you've already visited, right? If you use first visit MC, it will count the amount of time it took from the first time you got to that state till you got to work, which is really what you want. It's the total time. But if you use every visit MC, it will update the amount of time to be equal to the last time or every time that you visited that state, okay? So you may cut off some information that you actually wanted to include. So generally, when we're talking about 
episodic tasks like blackjack, etc. Let's try only doing first visit MC, okay? Because it makes more intuitive sense for some problems. So this was every visit MC prediction, okay? If we want to turn this into first visit MC prediction, all we have to do is three more lines where we keep track of the states that were visited in that episode and just say, okay, well, if that, if a state was already visited, just continue, go on to the next thing, okay? Because we only want to update it when we first see it. So instead of updating the, the, um, the average every time, we're going to only update it if it's the first time we see it. And after we do the update the first time, we add that state to the visited. So it's almost like a closed list, okay? But it's per episode, all right? Okay, so that's first visit Monte Carlo prediction. And when I get to the end of this lecture, I'll be talking about the project for the grad students in the course. And I highly recommend just doing first visit MC prediction for blackjack, okay? Well, it'll be generalized policy iteration, but, and we'll get to that. But I highly recommend doing first visit Monte Carlo blackjack as your project. It's very, it's kind of simple. It's intuitive. It's fun to visualize. It's fun to play around with. However, I'm not going to force you to do that project, but we'll, we'll talk about that a bit in a bit. But here's the algorithm if that's what you want to do. All right. Could we use dynamic programming to update blackjack? To, 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 sorry, to help solve blackjack. Turns out it would actually be very difficult to compute values for blackjack using dynamic programming, even though we have the model for the game of blackjack. I have the source code of blackjack, it's trivial to implement, so why can't I implement dynamic programming? It's because not only do we need to know like the model, but we need to know the distributions of the rewards, the next states, etc. So for example, if I'm at state 13.7 in blackjack and my action is stick, what is the probability of terminating the episode with a reward of plus one, right? That's actually kind of a complex calculation. Now, if I knew all of these probabilities, and I'm sure I could go through and calculate them all, but it would be a little bit difficult, then I could use dynamic programming. But in general, for, for environments that have stochastic elements, it's kind of difficult to use dynamic programming in general because we need to know these distributions, okay? So the, the probabilities, the distributions need to be known prior to applying dynamic programming. And that's a bunch of calculations that sometimes you can't even do, right? What's the probability that I run into a wall if I apply this voltage to my robot? I have no idea. I don't know that kind of thing. With Monte Carlo sampling, you don't need those probabilities. You just play. You just drive, you just experience, right? So Monte Carlo in general is more powerful than DP methods. All right. So now that we have those state values, how do we form a policy based on the state values, right? So without a model, we can't necessarily tell which actions lead to other states just using samples, okay? So we must calculate the value of doing an action at a particular state in order to know which action is best. And I just did this example, right? So think of the bandit example, think of the, the example we just did. So if you want to actually go ahead and update your policy, you can't just do the state value estimation. You need to do the state action queue update. Okay, so even though I included V there for you, it's the Q of SA that you really need in order to update your policy. And again, this is the expected return when you start in state S, take an action A, and then follow some policy after that. Okay, exploration. For many problems, the number of states and actions is actually really large, okay? So if we follow a given policy, we will do the same thing over and over and over and over. So what we want to do is we want to be careful to explore, meaning we should choose some actions at states that we haven't done before, right? So also explore with states. So we want to sample from states that haven't been visited yet. So what this means is that, and we'll show an example of this 
algorithm called exploring starts later. It's just that as we go, we have to make sure that we're visiting most of the states and we're trying most of the actions at least a few times in order to do that. So what we may have to do is something like epsilon greedy, right? Where we insert an epsilon where our policy, we're not, not always going to choose like the exact thing to do that's greedy. Sometimes we're going to choose randomness, right? When we go to choose actions, okay? So we've done Monte Carlo prediction, which is the updates of the estimates of the values. Now we need to do the control, which is the updating of the policy. So how do we update the policy? Well, it's exactly the same as the banded action selection, okay? Um, we've seen before how to estimate values given that we follow a fixed policy. So now how do we update the policy to perform better over time? So hopefully, <laughs> This is the whole point of reinforcement learning, that by learning the values of QSA over time, we can learn a policy that approximates the optimal policy, okay? And this, I think I talked about this a bit in the last lecture, but this process is called policy iteration. So once we have a value estimate, we update our policy incrementally over time. And last time we showed how we can, like, we choose greedy or epsilon greedy or UCB or whatever, okay? And this is called generalized policy iteration. In GPI, we're going to main estimates of two things. The current value function estimates, or the state action value function estimates, and the current policy estimates as well, so our current policy. The value function is repeatedly updated to more closely remember, remember, uh, resemble the true value function. And then the policy is repeatedly improved based on that value, okay? So generalized policy iteration is the following exam question. Consists of two processes. The first is policy evaluation. So if we have a policy and we take a bunch of samples from it, we're evaluating the policy to see what the value is. So policy evaluation is making the value function more closely estimate the value of the current policy by taking actions in the policy and seeing how they do. Policy iteration is the second part, which is making the policy greedy with respect to the current action function so that we update the policy so that it chooses the actions that we now, after we've evaluated them, know are better. Okay, so policy evaluation, policy iteration, policy evaluation, policy iteration. In policy iteration, these two processes, in, sorry, in generalized policy iteration, these two processes alternate. So you take, you do one of them, you do step one, then step two, step one, step two. GPI refers to the general idea of letting policy evaluation and policy iteration interact to improve a policy over time. And almost all reinforcement learning methods resemble generalized policy iteration in some form or another, okay? So this is really the key to reinforcement learning, at least in the context of this course. So GPI, again, over time, two things occur. Values approach the true values and the policy approaches the optimal policy. And when the process stabilizes, the process is completed. So like, how do you stop this process? How do you know when to stop? Well, what some people do is when it stabilizes. So if over time, for like millions of iterations, your policy is no longer changing, then you've probably found the optimal policy. So here's what happens. You've got this sort of cyclic loop going on where we take a policy, right? And we evaluate it. When we evaluate a policy, we get some rewards, some returns, and we update our values. So as we do the evaluation and we keep doing this more and more, then the value estimates that we have approach the true value of pi, right? Of our policy. Once we have done an, once we've done a round of updates to our value, then we update and improve our policy. And as we go, our policy is going to be essentially greedy with respect to V, okay? And this is the improvement step, the policy improvement or policy iteration. 
So we evaluate our policy, we get new values, we improve our policy and get a new policy. Then we follow that new policy. We improve our values, we update our policy to get the next step of the policy, right? So what it kinds of look like is this. We're gonna start out with some initial values, maybe they're all zero, and some initial policy, maybe it's all random. That is really far from the true values and the true policy, like the best policy, the optimal policy, right? So this line up here can be thought of as getting closer and closer to the true value of the policy, right? Initially, it's nowhere near the true value of the policy. Down here, we're going to have the policy getting closer and closer. So here, this is just a little diagram that shows, first, we evaluate our policy to get new values, and then we update our policy to get a new policy. Then based on that policy, we get new values. Based on those values, we get a new policy. And we get closer and closer and closer and closer, and we converge eventually to the optimal values or the true values of that policy and the optimal policy, okay? So this is the sort of process that goes. It's, a, it's an iterative process where, again, our we evaluate a policy to get new values, and we update our policy to reflect what those new values are. All right, so how do we apply the policy iteration to Monte Carlo methods? The policy evaluation part, we update the value estimates after an episode has been generated, okay? So we don't do anything when we take the individual actions. We only end the policy evaluation. We only do the updates after the episode has been terminated. Policy improvement comes right after that, before the next episode begins. So generate an episode, record the values, update the values, then update the policy, okay? And what, we, what it looks like is this. So where we had this on this slide, if we take this and we sort of look at it numerically or linearly, we start out with some initial policy, policy zero. That's, I don't know, initially random maybe, right? We evaluate that policy to get an initial guess at what the values of that policy are. Then we improve our policy based on those values. So the E here is evaluate, the I here is improve. So initial policy, evaluate, new policy, improve it. Or get the values, improve the new policy, now you have a new policy. You evaluate policy one now to get values one. Then. Based on those values, you get policy two, et cetera, et cetera, up until the point where this is guaranteed to converge, you know, as T approaches infinity, to the optimal policy and the true values of that policy. And so our policy, the way we improve our policy at a state is just the max, the, it's the action that maximizes um, our value, or sorry, our expected return at that state. Okay, so you look over all of your A values for QSA and you take the biggest one. So here's the big slide that explains everything, right? Here is what you will do for your project if you want to choose blackjack for the 6980 people. Um, let me move my, uh, my big ugly mug for a second. So here is Monte Carlo policy iteration, right? So we have a function, MC policy iteration. We have some initial value functions, Q, we have um, our policy P, which tells us what to do at each state that's initially equiprobable or random. Then while true, we do this loop here, okay? E, we generate an episode based on the policy. We did that with our blackjack example. Q, we update our value estimates based on the episode returns, right? So we look at what happened in the episode, we update our belief of the values of the state action pairs within that episode. Then we update our policy to choose the actions with the maximum values. So Q estimates the true values and P estimates the optimal policy over time until we've run thousands, if not millions of these episodes, okay? Which for blackjack is really easy to do because it's really fast to simulate. And in the end, hopefully, what we get is a policy that looks like this, okay? Which is hitting and standing what we do at each of the states of blackjack, okay? So over here is the player's hand, over here is like the dealer's whole card, and it shows us what to do, whether or not we should stick or we should hold. 
okay? Or sticker hit, sorry. So I talked a little bit about exploring before. Um, many problems have large state and action spaces. And so in practice, if we start from the starting state, many state action pairs will never be visited. And so this is really interesting because what happened when people started initially applying things like reinforcement learning to games like Go or uh, chess, for example, the game of Go and the game of chess always start in the same state. And if you like reinforcement learn against each other, you get pretty good. And so what happens is you only play and learn about games of chess or games of checkers or games of Go in which both players are actually pretty good. And then you play against some clown like me, right? And I start doing a bunch of weird moves that you never visited before and you don't know the values of what to do in those states. And this was actually a problem. Like they had one iteration of AlphaGo, I believe, was like it played and it beat like semi-professional humans, but it lost to people who were terrible because it didn't know what to do in those states that professionals would never visit, right? So it's, it's really interesting. And you need to make sure that you visit all of your state action spaces. So when generating episodes, it's important to vary the starting states, if possible, in, in order to ensure that all of your states get sampled. And so this process is called exploring starts or ES. Now, the good thing for your project, if you choose blackjack, is that blackjack sort of has ES built into it. Because every time you start an episode of blackjack, it deals a new random state, right? So ES is sort of built into blackjack because of the card dealing. However, you'd think of something like checkers, right? ES or connect four, ES is not built into those things. So it, you'd have to do something like that. So in Monte Carlo ES, so Monte Carlo exploring starts, all returns for state action pairs are simply accumulated and averaged. Monte Carlo with exploring states cannot converge to any suboptimal policy. It's a really good uh, property to have because if it did converge to a suboptimal policy, then the policy would be, would be evaluated. You'd see that it was bad and then your next version of the policy would be better. So like by nature, it fixes itself. It's really cool. Convergence to the optimal policy is intuitively inevitable as it changes into the action value function or as changes in the action value decrease over time. But this has not yet been mathematically proven, but it's intuitively inevitable, right? That you get here. So in practice, Monte Carlo with exploring starts converges slowly because, you know, it's hard to visit all the states in large problems. We can also explore while generating episodes using Epsilon Greedy or UCB. Okay. And by including those randomized actions, more states get visited, more actions get sampled, and we learn more quickly. So what I want to do now is I want to play um, a bit of an awesome YouTube video. And so I'm going to have to like uh, get my desktop audio working. So I'm going to play some of this video. And let me really quickly, oh, I have to turn on my lamp. It's really dark. There we go. So I'm going to play some of this YouTube video that does, this is a YouTube video um, from Stand Up Maths. And if you've ever watched it, you know how good this video is going to be. I'm probably not going to play the whole thing, but I'm going to play it to the point where you kind of get the idea, right? And in this, they use... Monte Carlo reinforcement learning. They don't explain it as that, but they use Monte Carlo reinforcement learning to update the policy for playing tic-tac-toe in a physical setting. So not even inside a computer. So this is like a physical reinforcement learning example that I think is super cool. So I'm gonna turn off my uh, webcam and my mic, and I'm gonna let this play um, for a few minutes, but not the entire video. But this video, can it can be on the exam the entire contents of this video so make sure you go and watch this video in its entirety please all right so let me hide myself here uh let's see all right i'm gonna hide myself mute my mic and play this for a little bit the 
Machine learning is all the rage these days, but how can inanimate objects learn from experience? Well, to find out, I'm here at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. A bunch of my mass buddies and I are positioning 304 matchboxes on a table. And this weekend, we're gonna teach that pile of matchboxes how to play knots and crosses. This pile of matchboxes is creatively named Menace for the machine, educable, that's a word, knots and crosses engine. So the great thing about knots and crosses or tic-tac-toe is that as a game, there aren't many possible states it can be in. And each of the 304 matchboxes has a different game state printed on the front. So this is a current position the game could be in. It's Menace's turn. There are three places Menace could play. And so inside here are three beads. Um, there's a purple one, a blue one, and a white one. And the different colored beads, there are nine of them in total, correspond to the different positions that Menace can play. So you have your go playing noughts and crosses. You then look up the box that matches the current state of the game. You give it a shake. You take out a color at random and that tells you what move Menace is gonna play. To learn, across the course of a single game, you keep track of which boxes were used and what colors Menace played. If Menace wins the game, you reward it by putting in three more of that color. If it loses, you punish it by taking away the color. So over time, it gets rewarded for winning, it gets punished for losing, and in theory, the colors will shift to match the optimal move for any given position. And so if we play hundreds of games against Menace, because at the moment it's got the same number of every color, it'll gradually learn what the best move is and it will get better and better. But to find out how good it can get, we have to play literally hundreds of games, which is why we're here as part of the Manchester Science Festival. There will be hundreds of people in here across the course of the weekend. They're gonna play Menace, and we'll see just how good it can get. It's Sunday morning, and members of the public have definitely shown up. Menace has played about 20-ish games, and so far, so good. And I'm now joined by the guy whose fault it is, Matt Scruggs. So, Matt, this is this is your Menace. You this made is my this. fault, yes. Right. And you're a maths PhD student at UCL? Yes. Doing? Numerical methods. Numerical methods. Then this is very similar to... This is nothing to do with numerical it methods. It's nothing to do with numerical methods. Right. Yeah. This is just a hobby? You... Yeah, it's something I did one evening because well, many evenings of gluing matchboxes. I was about to say, it's a lot of putting beads in boxes. I actually saw Matt talk about this at the Mass Jam conference, and I was like, we have got to get that and make a video about it, and so here we are. Now, uh, where would you come up with the idea? Um, so I found this in an old Martin Gardner book, and it, he was writing about a guy called Donald Mickey who built this in the 60s to demonstrate how machine learning works. It's pretty much what we're doing, I guess. And how did he train it? Um, so he spent a whole weekend playing against it himself. He played 200 games against it over one weekend and found after about 150 games, it was drawing was, consistently. Oh, okay, so out of 150, it had matched optimal play. And so is this the first time that a menace has played the general public? Just lots of people? Yes, yeah, as far as I know, it's the first time a general public has played All right, so it could go wrong. Now, you tried simulating this, and you showed me the simulations. And you reckon there's a 1 in 10 chance it'll die? There is a 1 in 10 chance that it may die by running out of beads in the first box. Of course, because every single time, if it loses a lot, we're always taking beads out of the first box. If that empties... Yep. Yeah, so some of the later beads... rage quits. So some of the later boxes can definitely run out, and that's fine. It's just learned to resign because it can't win. But if the first box runs out, it has learned to resign on the first move, and that is bad. Right, OK, so we'll see what happens. Were you simulating optimal play? Yes, I simulate optimal play there. If, when I simulated optimal play with a bit of randomness, it dies a little bit less often. OK, so we've got to hope that the members of the public are quite random, which I think they will be. Right, so your simulation's on your website. I'll put a link in the description, but we're going to hang around and see 
if Menace lives or dies. How dramatic. And now I'm distracting Katie, who's trying to work over here. So you're doing the data logging. Yep. Which is, oh, is this Matt Scroggs' system? Yes. Yeah, he's, he's coded What's this. What's he so coded that, that in, it. is it? Uh, I, I have no idea. Something. Yeah. Okay. We're calling it data scrogging for all purposes. Um, so what are we actually recording for each game? I'm recording, first of all, whether Menace wins, loses, or draws. So I'm going to record that it lost the last game. Oh, right. Um, and I'm also recording... Oh, there it goes. Yeah. Yep, that's appeared on there. I'm also recording what the first couple of moves of the game were, because this is useful to know kind of how it's learning. Right, and they're, they're the colours up here. So this is the plot of, I guess, how successful Menace has been. And, oh, are we doing? Just going to log the first two moves here. Nice. There we go. And so I've is really focused in on the center as the opening move. Yeah, it's got it's got a lot of green going on there. I think because every game that it started green, it's either drawn or won. Right. Well, there's a couple where it's lost. It's lost when it's, it goes yeah. edge first. It's I, lost. I suspect okay. it's lost all of its games where it started red. So I suspect there are no red beats left in that box now. Right. But that's good. That's, that's like the first step towards Norths and Crosses is go in the middle. Yeah, it's, right. it's learned go in the middle. And um, you're and logging? Yeah, I'm also logging the first move made by the person, by the human player right. uh, in the game, just because that is then useful to know, you know, what happened later on in the okay, game. Okay, we haven't got on here, but we can analyze it afterwards. We're yeah. actually, we're going to keep all the data. We're going to put it online afterwards. So if you want to have a look at the data that we've picked up, uh, that will all be available online. We'll put a link in the, in the notes. I'm the one who says there's a link in the description. Okay, there's a link in the description for the data. Unbelievable. Go back to the thing. Would you like to play Northern Crosses? Now, I'm saying by which color he starts. He's making it very obvious he's not looking. White. White. Okay, so Menace goes here. Oh. Where would you like to go? You got it. Oh. No, 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 destroy it. Oh. Yeah, don't be nice to this Menace. This is how it learns. You, yeah, it's, it's got to, it's got to learn from its mistakes. And the first, first move is the easiest one to explain uh, because in the, in the first move. All right. So, um, don't want to play the whole thing, but oh, where did my, where did my camera go? There we go. All right. So, watch that whole video. It's pretty cool. Um, and it just shows you that like you can do reinforcement learning. They say machine learning, but it is a type of reinforcement learning. However, there's something that I want to, uh, ask you maybe on an exam. Okay. So just think about this question. Menace didn't keep track of values, right? So in generalized policy iteration, we said that we have this QSA. What it was doing was it was keeping track of the policy directly, right? So the beads in the boxes were essentially a policy. So if there's three beads, three blue beads and one white bead, it was like 75% of the time choose blue, 25% of the time choose white. So it's a little bit different. However, just, just keep that in mind because there may be a question about Menace, how it works, in relation to GPI on the final exam, okay? It won't be too difficult, but you will have at least had to watch that thing in order to do it. All right, so that is that video. Um, apologies for having to play a YouTube video. I don't generally like to do that, but it's just such a cool video that I wanted to show it. Now, uh, for the second part of the uh, lecture, which isn't gonna take too long, I wanna go over the uh, 6980 final project specification. So if you're in 3200, you can tune out now. Nothing, nothing for the rest of this lecture is about 3200. All right, so the grad version of this course um, has a final project, which is worth 20% of the year. It is due Friday, December 16th at 11.59 p.m. That's the second last day of exams. So I'm giving you as much time as physically possible for me to be able to actually mark them, okay? So... It's due then, <laughs> there you go. So let me just read through this so I can make sure that I didn't have any typos or whatever. Uh, the final project of this course will be to implement one of the topics taught in the course to solve a problem in a slightly more complicated domain than those in the assignments. Possible ideas for the final project include. Now, I highly recommend just doing first visit Monte Carlo for blackjack. 
It's easy to understand. I've already gone over the algorithm. Um, it's there, you can implement it. However, you don't have to. For example, if you're working on AI for your masters or something like that, or if you're working on some other project that you would like more experience in before you get into your actual research, or maybe you wanna prototype what your research idea is for your thesis, for example, you can do that for this course. Like, but you have to use one of the methods that we taught in the course. So for example, um, implementing additional heuristic enhancement to A-star pathfinding, using larger maps, maps with additional properties, such as damage, hit points, etc. Maybe you want to implement a variant of A-star, like a jump point search or D-star or, or other variants of A-star search. That's something you could do. Um, implementing additional enhancements to alpha beta for like checkers, for example, you could make checkers and do that. Or you could use a genetic algorithm to solve some sort of interesting problem that, that you're interested in. Your project must visualize the new environment by, Rus by writing a custom GUI with human and AI controls. So for example, if you implement checkers, I wanna see the checkers board. I wanna see the pieces and I want to be able to play against your AI just like we could for assignment three, okay? So just realize that you have to write the user interface for this. Now it'll be a good example for you to do that, but don't wait too long to start on this project. Okay. Projects may be completed in groups of up to two students. So just like the assignments, the, pro the project will consist of four main parts. Okay. First is the proposal. The proposal is due in nine days. So it's worth 10% of the total project. Students will write a maximum one page proposal for the final project, detailing the students in the group, the algorithm that they want to use and the domain that they want to apply it to. I will review the proposals, then contact the groups if I think their project is not an appropriate amount of work. If you are choosing to do Monte Carlo for Blackjack, you can just say I'm doing Monte Carlo for Blackjack. You don't need to write a big old proposal because that's just, it's done, okay? But you gotta write a visualizer and like, if you're doing Monte Carlo for Blackjack, then what I wanna see is like, instead of, and for assignment five, we'll have like a, a user interface for pathfinding. I want to see the policies and the values updating in a table like this in real time as you keep going, like as you generate more and more episodes. Okay, so just keep in mind that just because it's MC with, with Blackjack doesn't mean it's no work. It's just the, the proposal will be almost no work because I know what that project is. Okay, once I get those, I'm going to immediately review them. And if I don't contact you within a few days, it means that your project is fine. If I do contact you, it will be to say, this is way too much work or this is not enough work, okay? The final code and working demo of your project that you submit to me, just like you submit an assignment to me, is worth 40% of the grade. Um, students will submit their final project code to run your project, including instructions on how to install any required libraries to run the project. Please don't use external libraries unless it is absolutely necessary. Just use the default HTML and CSS and JavaScript like in, in the assignments as well as instructions on how to run the project or reproduce that are the results that are included in your report. Unless it is absolutely necessary, imp your, implement your project in HTML and JavaScripts like the assignment. So what I mean by that is if you really have this like, if you're gonna be deep diving into something that's like related to your thesis and that's in like C++, fine, okay? But for the most part, just do it in C++ or and just do it in HTML and JavaScripts because you can use any code that I gave you to jumpstart your project. So let's say that you're going to be doing uh, checkers. You can take Connect4, you can do take all the visualization stuff that I did for that, all the user, the UI elements, and you can just change it to be checkers. Okay, so it's a, it's a good head start if you use the stuff that I gave you. The final report is worth just as much as the final code. So, Students will submit a final report delivered as a single PDF document. The written report of the project should include the sections detailed on the following page. So I'll get that to that in a second. The report should be written as if it was being delivered to someone other than the person who taught you the course. 
right? So you can't skip out on details just because you know that I know them. I want you to explain it back to me. So I want you to detail the algorithms and the experiments just as if you were writing a paper for a conference or for a journal, okay? And if you want to do this as like, you know, an actual conference style paper with some like um, AAAI format or something, that's fine. It's good practice for you to get used to that like LaTeX or, doc or however you're writing your journal papers. And the following page, is, uh, page gives details on that. Um, and I'll do that in a second. Finally, I want you to make a short YouTube video, which this is more for you than it is for me. Trust me, it's worth 10%. So students will make a short YouTube video presentation. It has to be between two and three minutes long. It cannot be shorter than two minutes. It cannot be longer than three minutes. Giving an overview of the project, which includes a screen capture demo of your program running and like calculating. So you should be able to see something happening. Voice narration by both group members. So you have to explain to me what's happening and a brief summary of the experimental results. So here's what we did. Here's what, here's the method we use and here's the experimental results. And honestly, this isn't just some scam. This is done mainly so that you can add this to your portfolio later. Okay, so if you go to apply for a job or grad school or whatever, this is a cool video that you can just have to show even your family members what you're doing in school, right? And it gives you practice making a presentation, gives you practice um, making a short video, okay? Which, as the pandemic goes on, is becoming a much, a much more desirable skill than you may have thought a couple of years ago. So that's the last part, it's just the YouTube trailer. It's not worth much, but it's worth enough for you to actually do it, okay? And you'll just attach that as a, um, a URL to your final report. Um, and here's the final report specification. Uh, the first section, and you can just take this, okay, literally take this page, copy it, paste it into your document, and have these sections with these subsections, okay? That's, that's what I want. So, introduction. Uh, a brief introduction to the project. Motivation why the project is interesting. Even though I know why it's interesting, I want you to write this as if I didn't know. Convince me that this is interesting, because that's how I'll be grading it. Okay, just like you're not supposed to say I'm doing checkers. Like, tell me why it's cool. Tell me why your algorithm matters. Tell me why you're doing this. Um, the problem description. So a high level description of the problem you're trying to solve, a description of the environment and some examples of possible states in the environment. So um, including the properties of the environment. Is it deterministic? Is it stochastic? Is it perfect information? Whatever. Um, some screenshots of sample states of the environment, um, the actions that are possible from states in the environment. If it's a game, provide the rules of the game um, and list the goal states or rewards or the objectives that you're trying to accomplish in that game. So it's like, here's checkers. Here's a couple of default, here's a couple of different states. Here's blackjack, here's some states. Here's the actions that I can do in blackjack. Here's the outcomes. Here's my goal in blackjack, okay? Methodology. Write an overview of the algorithm that you chose. Write why you chose it, citing the properties of the environment and how they relate to the algorithm, okay? The pseudocode of your algorithm with an English description of what it does. Um, give a reference to where in your submitted project the code actually is, so I can, I can go through it. Um, a list of improvements or optimizations that you made to the algorithm. So if you do alpha beta, for checkers, you can't just submit the same thing you did for assignment three. You have to improve it somehow. Maybe transposition tables or something like that. A list of heuristics that you used, um, if applicable. So this would also mean if you chose a GA, a list of all your fitness functions and why you chose them. And a list of things that you may have tried to do but you didn't get working in time. Section four is probably the most important, the experiments. A description of the experiments you ran to show that your solution actually worked including the machine specs, sample inputs, parameters, screenshots of some of the solutions it came up with, um, screenshots and or tables of results of experiment that you ran. So if you used A-star, the running times of the solution with and without your improvements. Um, if you used alpha beta, tables for like a round robin tournament with different amounts of players. So for example, alpha beta search with a lower time limit shouldn't beat an alpha beta search with a higher time limit. 
Um, win percent versus a random player is very important. I've got to see that your stuff actually worked. If you use reinforcement learning, show results for different learning rates, different values of alpha, how many iterations it took to converge, description of the final policy, etc. If you chose a genetic algorithm, I want to see that graph of fitness over time and what sort of stuff you did to try and improve that. A brief discussion of the results you obtained, whether or not you believe they're intuitive, etc. And then a brief conclusion, what you did, whether or not you were successful, and what you might do in the future if you have more time. Okay, so this is just like writing a paper, except your experiment is not that heavy. It's just do something for the course that you've already learned. All right, so again, get on this because in just over a week, your proposal is due, okay? And one, about a month from a week from now, so one month and one week from now is when your project is due. All right, so that's, um, that's it. That's it for the project, submit this as soon as possible, or send me a message on Discord and say, Dave, how does this project sound? I can give you feedback before you submit the proposal if you want, okay? Um, or send me a quick email and I can reply to that. All right, that is it for today. Um, a quick reminder, we have no lecture on Thursday because it is Remembrance Day. However, um, even though there's no lecture, I will be streaming at the same time on Thursday for an optional lecture where I'm going to run the Connect Four tournament from Assignment 3, okay? So on Thursday's class, at the same time, it's, it's Remembrance Day, so you don't have to tune in, it's completely optional, but I will be live streaming the tournament. We'll go through like the top 16 or whatever, okay? So that, that should be pretty fun. Come hang out if you're not doing anything. Otherwise, work on your assignments. All right, that's it for today. Thanks a lot. I'll see you in the next one.